Nisam Bulevinaka. Welcome to the MOOC on Climate Change in the Pacific Islands. We invite you to join us to be curious about climate change. What is climate change? How has climate changed in the past? How will climate change in the future? And why is climate change so important for the Pacific Islands, who are among the most vulnerable in the world to climate change? I'm Elizabeth Holland, Professor of Climate Change and Director of the Pacific Center for the Environment and Sustainable Development, where I work with a team of awesome shining stars who will be featured in the rest of this series. The learning outcomes for this session of the MOOC are, at the end of the session, you will be able to, one, explain the most recent climate change science findings, to explain climate change impacts on the Pacific Islands, and three, explain Pacific leadership towards climate solutions. 2016 is the hottest year on record. The Earth has warmed more than 1.1 degrees centigrade since the pre-industrial era. 18 of the last 20 years are the warmest on record. And one of the biggest concerns for the Pacific Islands is what will that warming temperature do to the rest of the planet? And one of the big impacts is that the sea level will continue to rise and rise even more quickly. So to date, sea level has risen 20 centimeters. But in the future, sea level will rise more quickly and is projected to rise a meter by the end of this century. One meter is about one paddle length. The projection of sea level rise here, made by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is 60% higher than the last time the scientists convened to say what the state of the science is. That was in 2012 that they released that report. More recently, we have seen an accumulating body of evidence that there are some surprises in the Earth system. And that's reflected in this paper led by Jim Hansen, who now works at Columbia University and was the first, one of the first scientists to draw our attention to the impact and the seriousness of climate change for the planet. So the title of this paper tells you everything about what we need to know. Ice melt, sea level rise, and superstorms, evidence from paleoclimate data, data in the past, climate modeling, and modern observations that two degrees of global warming could be dangerous. Our analysis paints a very different picture than IPCC 2013. If greenhouse gas emissions continue to grow, we conclude that multi-meter sea level rise would become practically unavoidable, probably within 50 to 150 years. So this statement means that the projection made by the IPCC is even greater than that projection made by the IPCC. First, our conclusion suggests that a target of limiting global warming to 2 degrees C, which has sometimes been discussed, does not provide safety. The global leaders decided upon 2 degrees C in consultation with the scientists some years ago. But now, as a scientific community, we're moving towards concluding that in the common meaning of the word danger, 2 degrees centigrade Celsius of global warming is dangerous. We conclude that the message our climate science delivers to society, policymakers, and the public alike is this. We have a global emergency. Fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions should be reduced as rapidly as practical. So where do we stand with fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions? Carbon dioxide is the primary greenhouse gas that's driving climate change. This is a record 
of those emissions. So you can see that in 1990, when this record began, the emissions were at about 22 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. They rose by 1.1% in 1990 to 1999, and by 3.4% in 2000 to 2009. Recently, in about 2013, the rise in global carbon dioxide emissions began to slow. So for the first time in history, we have three successive years, almost four successive years, with the slowing of global carbon dioxide emissions. The projection for 2016 is 36.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide. The slowing of global carbon dioxide emissions is largely driven by the decisions that China has made to declare a moratorium on building all new coal-fired power plants. But we're at a crossroads. We're at a turning point in which we can decide to follow the red line, the RCP 8.5, which will lead us to 3.2 to 5.4 degrees of warming. Or we can decide to follow the blue line, which is two degrees of warming, or a 66% probability of making a cap at two degrees of warming. Right now, through the Paris Agreement and the commitments that were made in Paris, we are falling between the red line and the brown line. We have committed to reducing fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions to about 2.8 or 3 degrees C, shown by the brown line. So here in the Pacific Islands, I made the point that we are amongst the most vulnerable to climate change. At PACE, we're working in 15 Pacific Island countries. Collectively, they're among the most vulnerable in the world. We're working in Timor-Leste, in Papua New Guinea, in Palau, in the Federated States of Micronesia, in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, in Nauru, in the Solomon Islands, in Kiribati, in Tuvalu, in Vanuatu, in Fiji, in Samoa, Tonga, Niue, and the Cook Islands. We're working in 120 communities to make sure that we are empowered to address the issues of climate change. In the Pacific Islands, we're already beginning to suffer the impacts of climate change. You see that in the video shown here, where storm surge in the North Pacific generated waves that inundated communities in Majuro, in the Marshall Islands, the capital of the Marshall Islands. We see in Tuvalu, the capital in Fanafuti, the capital of Tuvalu, that the capital is flooded at king tides. Here is the airstrip that delivers people and goods to Tuvalu. Here is that same airstrip at a king tide with the tide bubbling up through that airstrip. In Fiji, this last, in 2016, we received a visit from Tropical Cyclone Winston. Tropical Cyclone Winston had a very interesting storm track, came this way, passing past Vanuatu, close to the track that Tropical Cyclone Pam had taken the year before, went over towards Tonga, created $14 million worth of damage for agriculture on the island of Vavau, and then came back to Fiji, hitting Vanua Balavu at dawn, Taviuni, Koro Island, and hitting the coast of the largest island at dusk, at high tide, creating storm surges that exceeded 30 meters of wave height on Koro Island alone. We had 42 deaths, 62,000 displaced, over a billion dollars in damage in exceedance of this previous estimate of $500 million worth of damage. 
You can see here what the impacts of that storm surge were. This is for Koro Island, and this is that same village on Koro Island after Tropical Cyclone Winston hit. So of the 14 villages on Koro Island, all were damaged, and many of them were left with only a few homes standing. Now in 2017, we're still working to rebuild all of the schools and make sure that our children in Fiji have the education in more permanent buildings than the tents that they've been being educated in since Tropical Cyclone Winston. One of the impacts of climate change will be increasing storm surge for the future. So the estimates of how storm surge will change are shown here. So these are where the estimates of storm surge have been made. And if you look at this color bar, this is a multiplier factor. So we're looking at storm surge increases of more than a thousand fold. So that's the frequency of flooding events for a given height increment of 0.5 meters of sea level rise for one of the, midi the medium temperature scenarios. So if we choose the red line, that multiplier factor will go up even more. But to make sure that we're not just facing climate change as victims, but we're beginning to build the power to make choices for our future. We work on a more holistic approach to building climate resilience for sustainable development. We focus on the 10 Cs, collaborating for the future, starting at the community level, making sure that we conduct ourselves as examples of building that adaptation capacity, respecting culture, making sure that ecosystem-based conservation measures are included, that we have a long-term commitment to the future, to working with the communities, that we make sure that we're confident in our voices as we articulate the problems of climate change and the problems we're facing to the world outside, that we're ready to face the challenges that will come our way and work together to overcome them, and that we become champions for our own future. So we've developed some of the tools for doing this, including a tool called an integrated vulnerability assessment that gives us the means of assessing the sensitivity to disasters and climate change to see how this affects the ability of communities to meet environmental health, settlement, water, food, energy, and income security needs. It provides a baseline and a tool for monitoring and evaluation of what we've done so that we can acknowledge when we don't do it well and build better techniques for the future. It also gives our communities a means of communicating what their needs are to any technical service providers and the government so that we can work together. We also have a community mapping toolkit so that we map what some of our risks are for the communities on maps that can be easily communicated. The grandmother that you see in the top left-hand slide was the one who led community mapping for her village in Tonga. This is a village in Nauru where we're showing the example. In addition to focusing on the community level, we work to support the Pacific leaders in negotiating international agreements. We work to support the Suva Declaration on Climate Change leading that led us to the Paris Agreement. So the Suva Declaration was the strongest scientific declaration among the 10 declarations made by the Pacific. We, the leaders of the Pacific Islands Development Forum, following open, transparent, and inclusive discussions with stakeholders, declare that we are gravely distressed that climate change poses irreversible loss and damage to our people, societies, livelihoods, and natural environments, creating existential threats to our very survival and other violations of human rights to entire Pacific small island developing states. We express profound concern that the scientific evidence 
unequivocally, meaning without a doubt, proves that the climate system is warming and that human influence on the climate system is clear, but appropriate responses are lacking. More information on the Suva Declaration can be found at this website. But with this declaration, we went forward to Paris to negotiate the Paris Agreement that you can find in another supplementary video that's provided as part of this MOOC. And we're now on track to have Fiji be the president for the Conference of Parties number 23 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We're also training Pacific climate leaders, leaders for the future, from Tuvalu with Matt, from Calera in Fiji, working at the Ministry of Health, from Sai Navoti, who is now working to support the COP presidency, from Olai Uludong, Palau's climate ambassadors to Brussels, Khalifi from Tuvalu, Rainier Gabadu, who's from Nauru, who's supporting the Alliance of Small Island States in the UN, Rachel, who's now in Japan working on her master's, Ely, who's working with the Climate Change Division, Nicolette, who developed a gender-based toolkit, and Gareth Quitty, who's leading UNDP projects on climate change in the Solomon Islands. The ocean was given to us by our ancestors to manage so that we could pass it on to our children and future generations. It is our common responsibility and moral obligation for our children, said Foa Taloa, the Global Ocean Commissioner, so that we're combining the voices of the youth with the voices of the women, with the voices of our wise elders. To build a vodka that has two hulls. One hull is focused on cultural wisdom and one hull is focused on scientific wisdom. To weave a sail, to sail into the future. Venaka vakalevu, vafatai, malo, sulong, obrigado, thank you, Tomas, and thank you for joining us in this MOOC on climate change in the Pacific Islands. And please look for the supplementary information that we have because we've provided a poem on climate change from one of our finest Pacific poets, Kathy Jetnil Kilchner. Nakavakalevu.